What's up, you guys? Sean Ross at Fightful.com. Here with a name you know. You've seen him in WWE. You've seen him in WCW. You've seen him on television all over the place. We got Chuck Palumbo. Chuck, how are you? I'm well, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I mean, it's it's so good to talk to you. There's so much stuff to talk about. As, as I mentioned, you've you spent time in WWE, WCW, New Japan, All Japan. And that was even before you got into like hosting outside of wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. So what what are you up to nowadays for those that are like, hey, what's what's new in the world of Chuck Palumbo? Yeah, so right now I'm I'm just uh, started. I have a little project. It's called Chuck of All Trades on YouTube. A little YouTube channel. Nothing nothing fancy, but um, basically uh, we're just showing people what I do day to day. To day. Um, I grew up in the trades uh, long before wrestling. I was into um, you know home building, cars, motorcycles. My dad was a carpenter. My uncle was in the auto body business. Uh, the motorcycle business. Um, so been around it my whole life. Uh, it's a passion. And um, yeah, now I'm just kind of showing people what I do day to day. So uh, right now we're working on a, uh, I bought this house that was built in 1924 and we're doing a total restoration of the home. Oh, so nice. showing people that. And then um, we just built a 1500 square foot steel building on the property and getting ready to outfit that. And then we'll get back into the stuff that I was doing with Discovery Channel. I was hosting a couple of shows on Discovery Channel. We're going to get back into doing that and working out of that shop. But I started with the home and that stuff because I just wanted to give people a background on, on where this whole project started. So Yeah. I mean, I'm a big Discovery Channel fanatic. So when I saw you pop up on there years ago, yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is a this is a fit for me because love wrestling, love Discovery Channel. Have you found that your your time in wrestling has helped you? Uh, become a host, whether it be Chuck of all trades or whether it be <clears throat> Discovery Channel. Absolutely. Um, whether we like it or not, as wrestlers, to some degree, we are actors, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're not great actors, but we're actors. So that's where <laughs> the experience started as far as, um, you know, being in front of a camera, uh, speaking in front of a camera, live audiences, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that was a great, a great tool, a great help. And I already had the hands-on experience, you know, as far as the trades go, the automotive, the motorcycles, the carpentry, that kind of stuff. So I think it was a good combination because um, from what I found out from working with Discovery, you know, it's hard to find someone who does both, right? Yeah. And kind of knows the entertainment side of it, but also can, you know, grab a hammer and a wrench and make things happen. So I was very fortunate that um, I've had a lot of experience, you know, just growing up with different things. And so... Yeah. So, yeah, you've moved on to the Chuck of all trades. I think is a great idea. I mean, it's it's seeing how things come together and how things work. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I like covering pro wrestling so much. I get to yeah. find out about what goes into pro wrestling from the people who know it the best. And, and sure. you're a guy with a lot of experience showing people how these things are coming together. Do you ever find that that like maybe your old audience, your wrestling audience, is surprised? They're like, oh my gosh, he's into this now and he's doing really well. Because what we see on screen reflects part of your interests, but not necessarily all of it. Right. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, absolutely. People are surprised. People who don't know me are definitely surprised. Yeah, because a lot of times um, wrestlers are just considered wrestlers, right? Yeah. So people just know me as a wrestler. But if you really think about it, for me personally, wrestling was a very small period in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, from high school, I, I went to the Navy. I spent four years in the Navy. I worked on the flight deck of the, of the uh, USS Carl Vinson. I was a, a plane captain. And then I got a basketball scholarship out of the Navy. I played basketball in, uh, you know, uh, in school, in college. Um, so I had some life experience uh, long before um, pro wrestling. When I, was, I remember when um, I was in the Navy, I, was also in, I worked at a custom body shop where I was painting on the side. I was painting cars. Yeah. So you know, I, I've, I've, I've done a lot. I've been a bouncer, you know, um, and life experience pays dividends, right. When it comes to different things, when you have life experience and you're used to kind of stepping out of the box and you become comfortable being uncomfortable, trying different things, it, it just, you know, it helps. Right. So, so yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ramble on about that. No, question. I mean, that's what we're here for. But, we're here uh, to hear from but, you and about, about yeah. what you're up to. Well, obviously, one of the, one of the first times many of us saw you was WCW. Do you remember 
sort of getting the call up and like what you were told about general plans or, or anything like that, because a lot of you guys were, were brought in as the natural born yeah. thrillers. And it was, it was exciting for a lot of us WCW fans who wanted a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you say that because yeah. um, it was a very exciting time for us. We were new, we were young, we were eager to, eager to learn. We we're hungry. Um, so it was a great time. Uh, first getting called up. <laughs> I got stories, but first getting called up, <laughs> um, I'm in the power plant. Yeah, right? I'm in the WCW power plant, and at the time, this is that this is when Paul Orndorff took over. Yeah. So Paul Orndorff took over. Um, we had been working in the power plant for a while. Um, <clears throat> he knows I'm into cars, and I work on cars. <laughs> and he tells me, "Hey, Chuck, you know, um, I got this Land Cruiser, which he had been." working on this old Toyota Land Cruiser. I brought it in. You think you could do a, a, a brake job on it. <laughs> so he's like, listen, I'm going to be calling Jimmy Hart and I'm going to get you up there and uh, get you a shot uh, on WCW Saturday night. I'm going to bring him down to meet you guys. And then I've been talking to Jimmy. So it was like, he was kind of, you know, Paul's a great guy. Um, yeah. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from him, but I felt like, you know, the old time wrestlers, man, they used to really work their angles. So it was basically almost like a trade off. Like if I, if I worked on his, his vehicle, you know, he was going to call Jimmy Hart and, and give us a shot. So next thing you know, instead of training in the power plant, I'm in the parking lot while the other guys are inside training. I'm in the parking lot doing a brake job. On, on oh, my lane. gosh. <laughs> so so in, in was, my workout was, gear. was he satisfied with the work? He was. And, you know, it's funny. After that, I used to go over his house on the weekends and, and work on his vehicles, uh, particularly the Land Cruiser. So he would buy me, he'd buy me cigars and beers. I was going to say, was this pro bono work? Were you getting paid for it? Or was this like paying uh, your dues, kid? Exactly. I was paying my dues, <laughs> I think. But, uh, yeah, he would take me to barbecue. They had this barbecue place down the street. Uh, it was like a, this is long before the uh, food trucks, but there was this barbecue truck he'd take me to. And uh, yeah, he'd give me cigars. We'd smoke cigars and drink some beers and, and, and work on the truck. And, you know, I always wondered, like, damn, if I stop working on this truck, am I going to, you know, is he going to stop using me? <laughs> At so, what point yeah. did you realize you were you were pretty well safe in WCW and that they they wanted to keep you up there and keep you around? Because obviously, if something doesn't work, sometimes they'll chop it off at the legs and that, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, luckily, um, after a few months of doing that, working on the vehicle and, and working <laughs> TV on Saturday nights. When he realized um, his brake lines wouldn't work if you, if you got oh, sent back to the plant. Um, fortunately, Vince Russo came in. Okay. And he was interested in the young talent. So uh, luckily he was able to grab us and keep us there. And that, that was kind of the, the turning point for me where actually I stopped going to the power plant because you never knew like, should I stop going, yeah. showing up when I'm on TV? Am I, have I paid my dues? Right. Uh, am I going to rub someone the wrong way? Because you know the business. You step on someone's yes. toes, you look at someone wrong. You know, I tell a lot of people, right? One or two people's opinion of you or, or your talent can dictate your career. And right? I mean, a lot of what sort of the gimmick or the angle was with you guys was literally stepping on people's toes. You yeah. portraying like, hey, I'm replacing Lex Luger. Did you all get any resentment from people who maybe... I saw that as like, uh, this is art imitating life a little bit too much. Um, I didn't feel it personally. I'm sure there was an aura in the locker yeah. room because think about it. You got these guys who've been there a while. They have a solid position there. And then these young guys who are coming in, they're in shape. They're hungry. They're probably most likely willing to work for less money. Yeah. Right. Um, that's got to be tough for them. So I don't really blame them for that. But at the same time, we're young, hungry, and, you know, we need to live too. And, you know, if we get an opportunity, we got to take it. So it was a little tough, but, you know, fortunately there were people, uh, wrestlers there who actually believed in us. Like we had like, you know, Jeff Jarrett, you know, Jeff Jarrett, Scott Steiner, um, uh, Kurt Hennig, Kevin Nash, uh, Paige. Um, there were, there were people there who generally wanted to see us succeed, I believe. And that helped. That helped a lot. So to the I, point where they would actually work, they would work with us, you know? I know initially you teamed with 
Sean Stasiak before it moved over to Sean o- Sean O'Hare. What did you think about about the kind of the comparison between the two, and and how did you like teaming with them? Sort of, sort of compared to one another. I think a lot of people saw you and O'Hare, and they're like, "Oh my God!" Like that's that's going to be something that we see for years to come. Yeah, um, and that's what I was hoping. Um, two different guys, very different guys. Uh, Sean Stasiak comes from uh, a wrestling background, right? Second generation. His dad was a, a great wrestler. Um, prior experience from the WWF. Uh, in great shape, solid worker, but they needed needed something for him, right? So um, I enjoyed it. Good guy, got along great. Uh, he's a quirky dude. He's got a very he's, he's got an odd sense of humor, but I I got it. So yeah. I was fine with it. It's a good, good, good person. Good person. Um, uh, how do I say? Not much of a partier. Um, very serious about taking care of himself and succeeding in the business. Practicing promos, thinking about characters. Um, then you got Sean O'Hare on the other side, um, new to the business. Obviously, like like Sean Stasiak, great body. Impressive uh, physique, uh, facials. Uh, athletically, here's a guy doing uh, swanton bombs at yeah. you know six five two sixty or two eighty whatever he was doing swanton bombs. Um, green, not that I wasn't. I was learning on TV as was he. Green, but learning. Needed more time to develop. We, obviously, we never got to see his potential. Um, Stasiak was already, Sean was, Sean Stasiak was already solid worker, ready to go. But, um, you know, they, they, they loved O'Hare and, yes. you know, he, think about it. He was a big, impressive dude, right? Looked like and a million I, bucks, six, like six, four, six, five, two seventy. Yeah. Yeah. He was a legit six, five, easy two seventy. <clears throat> um, in shape and super athletic. So he just needed time. You know, he didn't get that opportunity to go um, train at NXT or, you know, something like that where they really worked with him. Um, I'm sure, like, if, if, if Paul Levesque had taken – because he would have – Paul would have – Paul has got a great eye. Yes. Um, if Paul took him right out of wherever he came from, so he wasn't tarnished by any other, you know, wrestling organizations, if he just – if Paul Levesque had brought him into wrestling – and kept an eye on him because Paul's good, good at that. Um, got a great head on his shoulders, understands talent, yeah. likes big guys. He would have shot him to the top over time. Did, um, which I think he could have did it with a lot of us, you know, with the transition. Did you keep in touch with, with Sean O'Hare in the years after he left WWF? Cause obviously he had a lot of demons. There were reports yeah. that he had uh, attended WWE sponsored rehab, maybe six times that, yeah. It it seemed like every year you would hear something new about him, positive or negative. Like he's getting into kickboxing, he's getting into MMA, yeah. he's he's a hairstylist. Then yeah. you hear some of the negative stuff. Yeah. Did you keep in touch with him and, and what was that like? You know, honestly, I wish I had kept in touch with him more. Um I don't think he was a lot of times I don't think he was happy with himself. Yeah. So he kind of didn't, you know, didn't he never reached out. But then again, that's on me too. I probably should have reached out more. Sure. Um, once in a while, he'd be out in LA or something and we would hook up, but you know, he had some demons. Um, uh, he, he couldn't shake them. And you know, honestly, I think a lot of people, this is a topic not often talked about, but I think for a lot of people who are on that stage and all of a sudden it's taken away from them, I believe depression can get into a lot of people's heads. So my belief is, he is battling some demons, but one of the biggest demons, I believe, may have been depression. Oh, uh, without a doubt, unfortunately. And, you know, yeah, he got into kickboxing and this and that. He didn't have a lot of success Yeah. because I never thought he dedicated himself to it. You know, as far as, you know, what you're doing in your personal life, the dedication to training, because he had the God-given talent and body to do it and ability, whatever you want to call it. I just think um, demons and maybe some depression. I, I may be wrong, but I got a little bit of life experience. Looking back at it now, I think those were where his uh, struggles were at. 
And we started to see, like, during that period, we started to see, like, the physique change. Like, he didn't look like the guy that we saw before, and he was... Right. When he seemed like a surefire, like, oh, this guy's going to be huge. And when yeah. you go back and you look at the people that he beat over the course of a month, I think he beat Benoit, Guerrero, uh, I think he beat Hogan in a match, and sure. Rikishi, and, like, all in the course of a month. They very clearly saw big things in him. But unfortunately, it didn't work out. And unfortunately, we're, we're talking about him in this vein instead of a different vein. But right. he's, he's always been such a fascinating case because we see people out of that group like you're a success story. Like you, you've done so many different things. And it's clear that he had interest in so many things like kickboxing or doing hair yeah. that he could have been successful at. It's, it's a shame that we're not talking about him in that same vein, which is a, very, a big bummer. I agree 100%. It's very unfortunate. Um, but it's not the first case we've seen, right? Especially yeah. in the rest, the wrestling business. <clears throat> I try to explain to people the dynamic of the wrestling business. Now, I'm not talking about in the ring. The backstage atmosphere, the business itself, to navigate that dynamic and be successful in that navigation is key. And a lot of people just can't do it. Mm-hmm. And not... And that's not a knock on them. A lot of people are just good, hardworking people who think, hey, I go in there, I wrestle well, I take care of myself, I look good. Hey, use me. That's not the case. So unfortunately, if you can't navigate that dynamic and, you know, you're not afraid to, you know, step on people when you have to, stuff like that. You know, I've heard Vince, I've heard Vince uh, tell people they're too nice. Yeah. So, um, Sean had a good heart, good person. He wasn't out to, you know, bully his way in or up to the top. I don't think he understood what it takes. You know, I, it took me years to learn, you know, I probably didn't understand the business until probably my last year. Like, I mean, truly understand the dynamic. Sure. Uh, And you're always learning. Yeah. So, and I've actually learned, I'm not in the business now and I don't really watch the business, but as I think about the past, now having more life experience, I understand more. So, You mentioned you know. Vince McMahon. What kind of relationship did you have with him? What kind of one-on-ones or interactions? Today, I hear those are much fewer and far between than they, yeah. they might have been uh, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, personally, I had an open-door policy with him. He was always kind to me. We always spoke. Uh, did we call each other on the phone? No. <laughs> but at the shows, always, you know, always kind to me, always spoke. Um, I believe at times he was supportive of me. I mean, I, you know, he, he told me, you know, but he's a busy guy. He's got all these other things to worry about. When they went corporate, things really changed. Um, his responsibilities came, became huge. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I felt like we had a, a good relationship. I never had an issue with him. Uh, we never had any problems. Uh, yeah, I can't, you know, I, I, you hear the stories and you hear the rumors about different things, right? You hear some crazy stuff. Um, what's true, what's not, I don't know. But I can't really honestly say anything. He's a businessman. Sure. So I never took anything personal. You know what I mean? Yeah. We- and that being said, I understand he's running a business. To be honest with you, I picked up so much about life and business outside of the wrestling business from him. I can't think of enough. You know, again, I'll mention it again. Uh, navigating through that dynamic of the wrestling business gave me so much life experience outside of it. So that's, that's really what I took from the business. We also hear of an influential guy, Kevin Dunn, who's been a part of the the company for, gosh, 30, 40 years at this point. Mm -hmm. There are some people that say that they've had some interactions with him. They've gotten some production tips. Other people, like in recent years, have said, they've said, it's like the voice of God. You hear him, you don't see him. Did you ever interact with Kevin Dunn? Like, did you ever, like, speak with him about how things were produced or anything like that? Uh, Not really. I mean, we spoke here and there, but did he ever share any tips i i I do remember i believe he invited me in the production truck once um to kind of see how things worked Mm -hmm. which was cool but as far as personal tips 
maybe once or twice, um, but we never really spoke a lot or often. I'd see him in passing, yeah. say hi, um, maybe see him at the at the hotel uh, bar after hours trying to get a meal, stuff like that. Would you ever hear that he would have influence? It's it's more today than it feels like it was back then. But obviously he was on like Tough Enough helping judge talent and stuff like that. We would see him there. Yeah. Well, I knew he had influence. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's obvious. <laughs> the guy's running the production truck. He's very tight with Vince. He's been there forever. Right? Yeah. You don't hear a lot about a lot. So obviously he plays an extremely important role. So I'm, that, I'm... that's about it. Speaking of those, those people of influence, you, you had a pretty big night, the last Nitro that, that ever happened. Uh, I mean, you, you were involved in a match there. What was the feeling like with you? Did you pretty well know, like, I'm, I'm going to be good. They're going to want me. I'm, a, I'm a, not, not just a prospect at that point. You were firmly entrenched in WCW. Yeah. Or was there, like, some question marks about your future? That's a good question. Um I was kind of up in the air. At one side of me, I was a little nervous because I didn't know where I was going to end up ultimately. Yeah. Did I think I was going to get brought over right away? In my gut, yes. We were young. We were in shape. We were hungry. Um, We weren't, I mean, we were making solid money, but we weren't making, a lot of the guys were making seven, eight, a million a year uh, for a guarantee. Um, you know, we were making excellent money, um, but again, we were cheaper, right? So I thought there was a good chance I was going to go over. Did, um, did you have much time left on your deal? Because I know that there were a lot of people that could have sat out. Like, but for example, AJ Styles and Air Paris, they told me they had like three, four months left on their deal. Like they, or, or they, I think they had signed a, a short term deal. And right. WWF was just like, nope. And then we saw a lot of people that sat out because their deal was so long and so good that it wouldn't have made sense not to. Right. I think that deal, I was, I think it was three years, and I may have had a little over a year left on it, hmm. maybe. Um, and I sat home for a few months, at least a couple months. But, you know, at that point in time, we weren't thinking dollars and cents business. We were thinking... We want to get over and be successful top guys. So that being said, were we willing to sacrifice our pay to get an opportunity? Yes. Looking back of it, was it the smartest thing to do? I don't know. It was a tough spot to be in. Because think about it. Now there's only one place to go. Yeah. Right? So it's tough. It's, a, it's basically a monopoly on the industry in the United States at the time. Yeah. It really is. It changed the dynamic. It changed everybody's pay. It changed the dynamic of contracts. It changed the. Um, it changed a lot. It changed a lot. There was a lot more control on talent because there was nowhere else to go. So, uh, kind of going back to WCW a little bit, were you ever told of any long-term plans that were set to happen before the the buyout happened? Were you ever told you were going to be in a top position there, or was it like a week-to-week thing where you kind of find out when you get there? Yeah, in WCW, um, a few times I had been told, you know, keep up what you're doing. We really want to build you. You know, I had heard that. Uh, I remember speaking with Eric Bischoff uh, one time in particular when I was doing the Lex thing. And he said, hey, we really want to get you over on this. Um, I heard from, you know, a lot of people encouraged me at that time. Say, hey, you're going to be, a, you know, this. You know, did I believe it? I don't know. I, you know. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, now in WWF, <laughs> no, there was no, there was no word of that. It was just, <laughs> it was uh, ultimately, and I believe it's still like this now. Most of the time in the business, it's a week to week thing. Yeah. Am I going to work tonight on TV? Did what I do last week was it good enough, or does it work, or will will it work with what needs to happen this week? And I believe a lot of the people still feel that way. Yeah, it, so, it seems so based on the people that I talked to. Yeah. You, you had mentioned Lex. Was he good with doing that sort of young guy is replacing me thing? Or was there any professional jealousy? Or was, was he all good with it? So I, I'm i not sure 100%. In the beginning, he was a little standoffish. Mm-hmm. You remember, 
and I'm sure you've heard it from other people at that time in the business that he was a very arrogant person. Yes. Very arrogant. Um, and that's when I thought of Lex Luger back then, that's the first thing that came to my mind. This guy is pretty arrogant. Um, but over time, uh, I felt that he was okay with it. Uh, him and Bagwell started to work with us a little bit. I got to work with Lex a little bit. Um, you know, personally, how do you feel about it? I'm not sure. But he started, I felt like he started to come around a bit, if that makes any sense. Yeah, of course. And you had mentioned yeah, at the same time, Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, at the same time, you know, he, he was a businessman, right? So he's got to think about himself Yeah. at the same time. So I understand that. It's un very unfortunate. Um, you know, I've seen little clips of him and where he's at today. Um, it's just, um, to me, it's just unfortunate to see a guy of that stature. I mean, everybody ages, I get that. But unfortunately, he's had some some health issues. Yeah. And, uh, Seems like a, a, a much different person. I hear nothing but good things about him now. That's what I was going to say next. I agree with you 100%. Seems like he's really found himself. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just by seeing, like, interviews that, you know, have been done. Because, you know, that's the great thing about Instagram. Like, all that stuff kind of comes in your feed, it, it, you know. And it's kind of cool because you see these, these different things. And uh, he really... Uh, Seems to be a kinder, gentler, a more appreciative person. So You had mentioned Eric Bischoff a little bit ago. I've actually talked to him a couple times this week. I did yeah. his show. He did mine. Yeah. Uh, I know you've, you've answered a lot of the Billy and Chuck stuff ad nauseum, but, man, that, that particular segment, the wedding segment, specifically yeah. his reveal was, like, oh, one yeah. of my favorite moments of that era. And yeah. rest their soul, three-minute warning. Like, it all yeah. worked out so well. So as, like, are you seeing him throughout the day as he's getting this makeup applied, or was it, like, super secret? I mean, it I'm was, sure you it, knew, obviously, but the application of the makeup. I didn't know everything. You know, I don't remember what I do to the T, but I don't remember seeing him much that day. <laughs> um, most, I believe most people didn't, when he was walking around, yeah. at times people did see him. I don't think people knew who he was. He did such a fantastic, I mean, the makeup's one thing. It was exceptional. But he, Eric's a talented dude. Eric's a very, very talented yeah. guy. Eric could be an actor if he wanted to. Um, so he pulled it off to a, to a T. And I mean, I don't know. How would you feel? I was like, I was, I was there in the ring and I'm going, oh man, this is awesome. You know? It was it was brilliant. The line that and, and the line that they wrapped it up with, did I just hear myself say three minutes? Yeah. It, it couldn't have been a better thing. Cause I mean, as as I'm a 16, 17 year old watching this, I'm like, where's this yeah. going? Where's it yeah. going? Yeah. The the whole story leading up to it. And I yeah. was like, the angle was literally a publicity stunt. We knew it, but like for them to turn that actually into the angle and then culminate it by getting a bunch of other people over as well. I thought it was one of the more masterful ways to book things because you get like five or six people over in one segment. Exactly. I mean, think about the people who were in the ring that night. You had him, you had Stephanie playing a big role. Um, Rico. You know, you had uh, Rosie and Jamal, yeah. um, you know, two great talents. Um, I got to work beside Billy Gunn. And then, you know, Rico, a lot of people, Rico was a very, very talented person. He was a former very, American Gladiator winner, wasn't he? Yeah, Rico, Rico is a stud. Rico has so much, you know, life experience. And, that, that you know, he had a ton of life experience going into yeah. to wrestling. So, yeah. Great time. Um, very fortunate to be a part of that, of that not, not only that era, but that actual, that actual scene. So I'm always interested about the Royal Rumble. I, almost everybody that I talk to, I ask about their Royal Rumble experiences, and then I do like a big feature on it each year. You were a yeah. part of a couple of them, and, and a lot of the people I talk to, th there's not a lot of instruction to be given. They go out there, they get thrown out. You've been in a few, and you had some eliminations. Do you remember the process of putting those together, kind of how they came together, and, and any fond or negative memories about the Royal Rumble? You kind of knew what number you were. I remember always, always, and only a couple of times, I remember just trying to remember who was going out before me. You get a lot yes. of guys, right? Yes. The Royal Rumbles are tough. They're dangerous, number one. They're dangerous. There's too many guys in there. Uh, number two, they're just, they're all over the place. And then some guys are trying to get, you know, trying to get high spots off. 
in the ring when there's all these guys. It ends up just being a lot of punching and kicking, unfortunately. But I get it. I get the you know I get the whole gimmick. But um, I don't you know to be honest with you, the only thing I remember about the Royal Rumbles, I remember one I believe was maybe maybe at MSG. Yes. When I was doing the biker gimmick, and I believe Shawn Michaels was, was in it, and I remember Shawn because you know who I always respected as a work great great talent. I remember he asked, told me, hey, uh, you know, give me a you know a push pre- overhead press. And I remember at the time I had a super nagging uh, oh. rotator cuff injury. So I was like, I don't know if he was punching me or what we were talking in there, but I was like, I, I can't, my shoulder's messed up. But I was thinking, gosh, I was like, this guy, you know, here's a guy who's way over and he's asking me to, you know, do an overhead military press, which I thought was cool. Um, it, or that just basically, you know, that uh, builds my character, right? Yes. Um, and I couldn't do it because I, my shoulder was shot. But um, so unfortunately, that's one of my memories. The other one was, I don't know if Austin threw me out of the other one when I was doing the Billion Chuck character. He might have, so. but uh, we didn't say much. I don't remember. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was, I just remember they're, they're kind of a cluster, you know? Yeah, it was it was Austin. And, and there were a couple of eliminations you had in that one. There was Godfather and Albert. You and Christian eliminated them. What, yeah. Was that told to you specifically by anybody? Like, hey, we, we need you two to eliminate these people. I believe yes. I believe yes. Yeah. So, and, and then in 08, I remember John Cena came back that year, and it was a huge, like, surprise. Were you guys clued in? Like, had you all known? Because I know that you came out very early in that Royal Rumble, but I also know WWE has been particular about leaks, and when you're going to be in that match for a few minutes, maybe they don't clue everybody in, but d- had you had any idea? I, I believe I had an idea. Did I know the detail? No. But I think I had an idea. I mean, yeah, they were pretty tight-lipped, but I, I didn't know exactly what they'd be doing. But uh, who did he go over in that? Was he the yeah last, it, last man standing? Yeah, yeah, John Cena won. He he came in as the big surprise thirty entrant yeah. number thirty entrant, and he yeah. won that Royal Rebel at MSG because yeah. he was supposed yeah. to be out for like six seven months with a shoulder injury. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I think I knew most of that, but as far as the detail and how it was going to happen. No. Now I know a lot of people might not remember this, but I was so deep into SmackDown at that time. You and the FBI had a bit of an angle leading into the 04 Rumble. Like, there were a series of matches. There was uh, Benoit and Cena against you guys, and the winners would enter the Royal Rumble, and you guys didn't win that. Like, the running gag was, you guys are trying to get into the Rumble. Then there was a mini Royal Rumble with you, Stamboli, Nunzio, and, and Benoit. And then there was another Battle Royal where Nunzio beat you and Stamboli, you know, just so he could go in and get speared by Goldberg, yeah. which was which was good. What do you remember about that story? Do you remember that like being laid out well ahead of time? I know Paul Heyman was instrumental in that era of SmackDown. Yeah, um, being laid out ahead of time. No, I think that was a fly by the seat of the pants thing, as was a lot of things. Um, to have something late for a mid card guy or mid cod stable to have something laid out three or four weeks in advance. <laughs> that's a rarity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I really didn't know. It, it was a, back then it was a week to week thing. I remember yeah. we had some, we had some solid matches with uh, Brock. We had some solid matches with Taker. Um, I just, I remember those, I don't remember the matches in particular, but I remember those times. I just remember having solid matches with them and really enjoying it. So I re- like that was three consecutive weeks that that happened. So that was sort of like, it was sort of an ongoing story and you guys were involved with the guy who was going to win the Royal Rumble that year because right. the, the gimmick was that Paul Heyman did not want Benoit in there. So was it, were you happy to be involved with that knowing that he was probably going to be on that ascent or were you at that time where you like, I'd rather be doing something else? Um, I think I was content with it. Um, I, I gotta be honest with you. I was, always pretty content with the fact that I was on the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously you want to continue to grow. Um, so those were my concerns more than anything else. It was to continue to, uh, to climb the ladder, but yeah, I always just, I was, you know, I, I tell people this all the time. I come from humble beginnings. Yeah. So the fact that I'm, I'm wrestling in the WWE and I'm on TV every week, wrestling, making good money, more money than I've ever seen. It's like, doesn't get much better than that for me. I was, I was happy. 
I'm always interested about the video games too. Were you ever involved in the production of those? I know sometimes they had people do mocap. Sometimes you got to get scanned, anything yeah. like that. And you were in a couple of them. Yeah, just the only the um, okay. So I remember um, I can't remember what they call it, but um, they put those those motion dots. capture. Yeah, they put the okay. the suit on you, the, the dots. Yeah. yeah, I did that once, and then. Um, yeah, I got scanned a few. I remember that they actually take the scan truck to the arena and, you know, back in the back parking lot kind of thing. And I remember going on the scan truck a couple of times. I think they did that for the video games and they do it for the um, the figures. Yeah. The action figures. Yeah, I did that a few times. That's so, about it. So recently I interviewed, I don't know if you'd be familiar with them because you, you mentioned you don't watch the product these days. Uh, we, we heard from Jungle Boy and a guy named Griff Garrison. And let me tell you, they have some very Palumbo-esque hair. From back in the day, yes. Oh, the 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 curls. It's it's beautiful hair, yeah. and they yeah. shocked the world because you know they're asked what shampoo do you use, and they're like Kirkland, which is the Costco brand. <laughs> right. What were you using back in the day? That's a good question. I'll tell you right now. I remember because I still use it today. Um, Pantene Pro V. Okay. <laughs> See, I mean, that's, that's at least that's sort of that's got a name behind it. You know what I mean? Well, There's some history there. That stuff, it was good stuff, and you could get it on the road. They sold it, you know, they sold it at you know CVS. You didn't have to go to the salon to get it, you know. I, oh. you, people, I mean, we're talking about hair. This is funny, but I never did anything to my hair. I washed it. That was it. I never, I never combed it. I never did anything. You're Not, born comb with it. it. Comb wouldn't go through it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> that was just it. So what's your reaction? I assume they told you to cut your hair for. You know, no, that's not your... what happened. Oh, please tell me. Oh, the hair fell out is what happened. So uh, what happened was um, when we started the Billy and Chuck thing, Vince told us the night we were going on TV, American Airlines Arena, Dallas. I remember that, you know, like four o'clock in the afternoon. He's like, yeah, you guys are going to have platinum blonde hair. Oh, no. Said, I'm thinking, all right, cool. So they have those girls who travel with us and they do hair and makeup, right? Yes. So these girls processed my hair. For like two hours, three hours to make it platinum blonde in one day. Oh no! So it went from, you know, brown to orange to, you know, to yellow, all in one day. And you know, I don't know if you've ever. My grandma was a hairdresser. Bleed. Yeah, <laughs> so. scalp bleeds. So every fifteen twenty minutes, I'm jumping in the shower, washing the blood out, and washing the chemical out. Then I go back in the chair and they do it again. Oh so gosh. the hair didn't last too long after that. My hair was not supposed to be blonde. Um, so what I did eventually was just falling out, not like from the scalp, but it was breaking off and stuff yeah. like that. So eventually. Cause that's damaging uh, your hair is what this whole process is. You're, you're damaging your hair, you're making it weaker. Yeah. So I just said, let me cut it off and I'll grow it back later. Were they yeah. fine with that? Were they like, okay, was there an me. I'm sorry or anything? I didn't ask him. I just did it. I just oh. did it. One day I came in, my hair was short. No one said anything. It just made the thing was, you know, when you travel down the road and you're doing this, you're gonna bleach it all the time. It's very, uh, it's a lot easier to do it when it's short. Yeah. So it just made it easier. And then think about it. It looked super. The hair looked so fake when it was blonde and long. Think about it. I gotta walk around my town when I go home. I gotta go to the store. I gotta travel through the airports. I looked like. You know, I probably look like a freak. Here's this guy, 6'5", you know, 270 pounds, and I'm walking around, like, you know, with a – been in the tanning bed too many times because, you know, back then it's all about tanning. So here's a guy who's been in the tanning bed too much, and he's got bleach blonde hair. It was like, oh, man, what am I doing? Uh, <sighs> Chuck Palumbo, thank you so much. Guys, check him out. Chuck of all trades. We've got to talk again because there's so much stuff that I didn't even get to ask you. I want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time. No, no, I appreciate it. And, you know, I – um you sincerely know a lot about not only the business, but you knew a lot about what I did. So I, I appreciate that you, uh, you know, that you do and you pay attention. So thank you. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate that guys check him out. We're going to have all the links in the description below Chuck Palumbo. We got to talk again. So right, let's soon. do it. Absolutely. Until, until next time, guys, we're out.